grace, mercy, and peace are yours. From God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The portion of God's word to which I direct your attention today is recorded in the fourth chapter of Paul's letter to the Christians in Philippi, beginning there with the tenth verse. We read these words. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. When's the last time you felt really contented? Maybe after a nice meal, like a Thanksgiving dinner, you had just the right amount of food, you know, not so much that you were stuffed, but enough, enough to be satisfied. Maybe you sat down in your, your recliner afterwards and, and everything was right with the world. You looked outside and it looked real cold, but where you were, the temperature was just absolutely perfect. Maybe earlier in the day you, you, you were a little stressed, but now you're ready to just take a nap. In the words that I just read to you, the Apostle Paul talks about contentment. Only the contentment that Paul is talking about there is not a physical contentment. It's a spiritual contentment. It's a contentment of the soul. The ninth and the tenth commandments God tells us he's looking for contentment. They express what God wants. You see, those commandments both forbid coveting. And coveting is having an excessive or unreasonable desire for something. In his letter to the Romans, the Apostle Paul says, coveting is really idolatry. To covet something is to love something as I should only love God. It is to think I can find my ultimate fulfillment, my ultimate satisfaction, my ultimate contentment in something or someone other than God. A contented heart is the opposite of a covetous heart. A contented heart is satisfied with what it has. And a contented heart is also the key to avoiding the pitfalls of all the other commandments. Why would I want to steal somebody's wife? Why would I want to steal somebody's money? Why would I want to rob somebody of their reputation? Why would I want those things? Why would I need those things if I had a contented heart? So if I were to tell you today that you can learn the secret of contentment, would you listen to the rest of the sermon? What's the key to it? Well, it, it starts with this. The first part of it is realization that we're not going to find contentment in anything apart from our God. Inside of all of us, there's this, this desire, this longing to, to fill ourselves with something that's going to bring contentment. But the sad reality is that if we're looking for contentment anywhere apart from God, we'll never be content. Let me say that again. If we're looking for contentment anywhere apart from God, we're never going to be content. Did you hear what Jesus said in the gospel lesson? Life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. What he's telling us is contrary to what people think. Satisfaction, fulfillment, contentment is not going to be found in the things of this life. 
Paul learned that. You know where, where Paul was when he wrote the letter to the Christians in Philippi? He was in Rome, in the city of Rome, but he was imprisoned. He was under house arrest. He couldn't go around the world, which was his passion to do, to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. He couldn't even go into the city of Rome. He couldn't even go outside of his house. He was under guard with heathen guards outside of his house 24-7. And yet if you read through the letter to the Philippians, never once do you hear Paul complain. He doesn't complain about his food. He doesn't complain about the guards. He doesn't complain about confinement. In fact, if you read through that letter, you see over and over again the Apostle Paul expressing joy. Rejoice, rejoice, he says it over and over again. Even in these verses, he talks about his joy at being able to reestablish his contact with those Christians in Philippi. But note where Paul places the source of that joy. I rejoice greatly in the Lord. Paul understood that real joy, real satisfaction, real contentment wasn't possible apart from the Lord. It's hard to remember that, isn't it? God, God has given us so many wonderful things. He's given us pleasure. Pleasure is a creation from God. And it's nice. And so is money. And so is sexuality. And so is companionship. And so is comfort. Those things are created by God. Those things are blessings of God. It's nice to have those things. It's not wrong to want those things. And we could even say the same thing about the cottage up north or the fishing trips or the boat on the lake or our house or our family. Those are blessings of God. Those are, those are things created by God. We could say that those things are the icing on the cake of the life that God has given to us. But they're not food. They're not food. They're icing on the cake that God has given to us. But you can't live on icing. Can you picture that in your mind? Can you picture the shape of a person physically who just tried to live on sugar? Well, if you can picture that, then you can start to imagine the spiritual shape of a person trying to live on icing. Paul learned that. Have we? What fills our mind? What occupies our time? What are our hearts fixed on? Our children? Our job? Our house? Our money? You see, Satan is so clever. He knows what a trap those things can be for us. When we have little... We look at our neighbor's house, our neighbor's wife, our neighbor's reputation, our neighbor's money, and, and we would want those things, and Satan draws our attention away from the Lord. But the opposite is always true, also true. When we have those things, we have the money, we have the house, we have the family, <coughs> then Satan blinds us to the fact that there's no real satisfaction in those things. And so we can't be content because we're trying to live on icing. Not Paul. Listen again to what he said. I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. It's pretty hard to think of a Christian whose life was a bigger roller coaster than that of the Apostle Paul. Ups and downs all the time. Yeah, you know, there were times where, where he was really well fed. He was surrounded by brothers and sisters in Christ who, who supplied him with food. But there were times, lots of times, he went to bed without anything in his stomach. 
There were times when he was on a, on a ship, on a cruise to a Mediterranean island to spread the gospel, and there were times when he was fighting from drowning after a shipwreck in the sea. There are times when he was absolutely safe and secure, and there are times when his very life was hanging by a thread. And yet Paul can say, I've learned to be content in any and every situation. What was the secret of Paul's contentment? In a word, it was Jesus. Jesus taught him, gave him the strength to see that in his Savior, he had such wonderful blessings that were greater than any of the blessings this life had to offer and could enable him to meet any challenge that he faced in this life. Paul's contentment did not come from the Stoic philosopher of his day or our day who say you just got to have willpower to live above your circumstances, to grin and bear it. His contentment didn't come from the power of positive thinking. You know, you got to see the cup half full all the time instead of half empty. And his contentment didn't come because, okay, I've trained myself to see the silver lining in every cloud. No, Paul's contentment came from Jesus, who gave him the strength to see that the blessings in his Savior meant that he didn't have a cup half empty or half full. He had a cup overflowing with goodness and grace. Can you and I, can you and I learn that kind of contentment? Others have. I'll point back to the reading of Asaph. Asaph says that at one point in his life, he looked around at the heathen world and he was filled with covetousness. He envied their lives. He envied their lifestyles. He wanted what they had. He almost fell away. But as he taught Paul, the Lord taught Asaph that the things of this world held no real future, no real hope for him. And by contrast, when he focused his attention on the Lord, Asaph could say, Whom have I in heaven but you? And there's nothing on earth I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but you're the strength of my heart, my portion forever. Asaph and the Apostle Paul had something in common. They didn't nibble around the edges of Christianity. They didn't try and find contentment by saying, well, I guess I better become a little more religious or I guess I, better, guess I better maybe have a little moral reformation in my life. No, you know what they did? They took their relationship with Jesus seriously. They pondered the depth and the breadth and the width and the height of God's love for them. They grew in grace and in the knowledge of their Lord Jesus Christ. And as they grew, they became more and more contented. Brothers and sisters, that works. Jesus can teach us the secret of contentment and will. For one thing, in the Bible, he's given a whole book dedicated to showing us the vanity of trying to find contentment in the things of this world. Do you know what book that is? Ecclesiastes. It's written by Solomon. Solomon says, I denied myself nothing in life. I indulged in every pleasure and I pursued every treasure the world has to offer. But you know what he learned? Apart from God, he says at the end of that book, everything is meaningless, utterly meaningless. But to teach us real contentment, The Lord doesn't just show us the vanity of things of this world. He also, in that book, has filled the pages with stories of his love and his grace. And tell me we don't need that tonic for the soul. For the last several weeks, we've been 
looking into the mirror of God's law as it's expressed in the commandments. And that's not an easy thing to do. The commandments have a way of exposing our sins and crushing our hearts with guilt. And if you've been here, and if you've listened, then like me, you've felt the hammer blow of God's law on your heart. But God's word doesn't just reveal his hatred and punishment of sin. It also reveals his unfailing love and his amazing grace. And it's that message of, of his love and his grace in Christ that gives us the secret to contentment. That message focuses our attention on, on Jesus who came into this world to live, to die, to rise again so that we could have the guarantee that our sins have been removed from us as far as the east is from the west. Ponder that thought. How far is that, the east from the west? Or what about that, that beautiful assurance that because of what Jesus has done, God says, I will forgive your iniquities and remember your sins no more. Think about that. The sins that you wake up thinking about at night, the sins that you can't forget, the sins you want to forget. God says in Christ, he's not only forgiven them, he's forgotten them and you can too. Or, or what about that, that beautiful assurance that God gives us through Isaiah? Come now, let's reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white like snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be white like wool. Let, let's remember that it is in the context of this terrible struggle to find contentment that Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It was the love of God in Christ that sustained him, and it will do the same for us. But will you admit something with me? Will you admit that we sometimes talk a lot about God's love, but fail to just stop and ponder it and personalize it? Messy as our lives are, broken as every one of us are, Confused, complex, he still loves us. He loves us with a love that, that stretches back to eternity and tells us before he created the world, he knew your name. He knew your name, he knew your sins, and he planned to send Jesus to live, die, and rise for you. And that love meets us in the present and surrounds us with his protection guarantees us answers to our prayers, provides for us, assures us that anything that threatens us will work together for our good. And that love stretches into the endless eons of the future where he's prepared a home for you, where because of Jesus, you're going to live with him forever and ever in bliss and joy and perfect contentment. Brothers and sisters, ponder those things. Bask in the love and the grace of your Savior. And you too will learn the secret of contentment. Amen.